with a key. I want you to see, I'm trying to hurt myself now. Pop! See what just happened? My hand is fine, and the key recedes into my grip. The art of fighting without fighting? Show me some of it. Hi there everybody, Michael Valenti here with the School of Self-Defense in Indianapolis. And in today's video, I am going to be ranking self-defense weapons. Now usually I make my own tier list, but I thought it might be interesting today to go to tiermaker.com and see what sort of self-defense weapons templates they already have available. Here we go, this is perfect right here. So we got self-defense weapons, perfect. So we'll click on that and then I'm already seeing some crazy ones. Looks like we've got a knife, a stick, a fire extinguisher. Um, looks like a bow and arrow, maybe. Okay, cool. So they should have a presentation mode. Boom, look at that. Isn't that perfect? Awesome. So let's go ahead and get into it. So taking a quick look at these, I kind of want to organize them a little bit better than they're organized. So I switched this from an A to F tier system. Uh, because I'm just looking down here and I see a couple things I think might fall under F tier. And I don't really believe in an S tier for self-defense weapons because S would insinuate like a weapon that's guaranteed to keep you safe every single time. And I just don't think that exists in self-defense tools. And like I said, this video is more of me kind of grabbing the first tier list that I saw on the website and just kind of seeing what the general public has put together and then kind of responding to that. The first weapon on this list is a stick. Now to be honest, I am a Kali practitioner. That is one of the martial arts that I study. I've been studying Kali since 2006. I teach it at my school. Um, I love Kali a lot. And so to put a stick anywhere other than A kind of feels wrong. However, the truth about the stick in Kali is that the stick that we use in Kali is a rattan stick and whereas it hurts like a son of a gun and could definitely fracture ribs or or apps or break fingers it's really not a like it does it doesn't have stopping power to it I imagine if you made it out of something other than rattan like maybe you had like a hard oak maybe or a mahogany uh, stick, maybe that would that would be a much better self-defense tool than kind of a rattan stick that we normally see in Kali. The stick represents any kind of improvised weapon you might get a hold of. So yeah, you may be grabbing a stick, but that could be a crowbar, that could be a knife, that could be a machete, and of course in older times that could be a sword. And so the idea is that they would train with the stick so that if they did hit each other, it wouldn't be a lethal blow. The other issue with any kind of impact weapon, I'm thinking this is going to go to C. The other issue with any kind of impact weapon is the fact that an impact weapon requires strength to use. If you've ever done demolition work and you've handed a sledgehammer to a very weak person, they oftentimes struggle to really get the force behind it to break through stuff. While an impact weapon will increase your offensive abilities, I don't really think an impact weapon is what I would call an equalizer. I think it gives them a slight advantage, but you will still require a lot of skill and to a certain extent strength to make any kind of impact weapon useful. The benefit of kind of the Kali stick size, which is, you know, usually, you know, just about as long as someone's arm is that it serves both as a long range tool and as a short range tool. As a result of the fact it can be used one handed, it does make it a viable tool for defense against multiple opponents. And if things get really close in, it still has impact power because it has the back end of it, which we call the puño, that you can strike an opponent with. So I think a, we'll put it at C, and I think it's good to put it at C because I feel like that kind of sets the precedent for what a through F actually means. A stick, which is gonna be the most common weapon in the world, is gonna be our baseline. So that's what we're gonna call like an average weapon is a stick. And so we gotta think, is it better or is it worse than just having a stick? Okay, so right off the bat, we're getting into a pistol, a gun. One thing I kind of wanna just immediately address right as I get into this is acknowledging the fact that a pistol 
is not a readily available weapon for every person. That there are a lot of countries, cities, states, and locations that it is illegal to have a gun in. I live in Indiana where we can have a gun in most places, but we don't allow guns at schools. We don't allow guns in government buildings. And I live very close to Chicago that has very strict firearm laws. I think it is important that we keep in mind that when we're talking about a pistol, we are talking about a weapon that is very limited in where you can carry it and where you can use it. Like I said, there's entire countries where you're not allowed to carry a gun. Because of that inherent limitation of a pistol, I really feel like we should start it off in B tier, and then I'll kind of explain why it should be in A tier. Another major issue of a pistol is the fact that you are going to have serious legal ramifications for using this weapon. There are a lot of very stupid people out there who say things like, I would rather be tried by 12 than carried by 6. I think a lot of those people are more so playing some weird power fantasy than actually preparing for self-defense. One of the biggest issues, just period, when you carry a gun is that every fight you are in is a gunfight, whether or not you are using it. So if you have that pistol on your hip and somebody tries to swing on you, you are not in a fist fight, you are in a gunfight, even if you don't draw it because there is a gun present in that fight. When you put that gun on your hip, you are taking a tremendous amount of responsibility onto yourself that you are willing to use lethal force if you have to. I th honestly think that there's a lot of people who think they have what it takes to take someone's life, but by the actual numbers, by the actual statistics, that's not true. Most people don't have what it takes. Another tremendous downside to the firearm is that it takes a lot more training than people think it does. If your idea of using a gun for self-defense is that you go to the range like three times a year, stand in isosceles stance and put holes through paper, and then you kind of carry your gun with you wherever you go, that's not preparation for self-defense. Any serious gun-based self-defense instructor recommends putting thousands upon thousands of rounds through your weapon on a fairly regular basis, practicing scenario training, pr going to gun courses that allow you to do things like shoot from cover and shoot from the hip. If you aren't training a firearm in the same way that anyone else would train self-defense, your weapon is probably not the best self-defense and you're probably playing some weird power fantasy game in your head. So hopefully after all of that, I have a whole bunch of people fiercely typing in the comment section and, you know, helping to boost the algorithm because even with all of that negativity, all of that stuff I just said, there's no doubt in my mind that as far as self-defense weapons is concerned, a pistol is going to be in A tier. The absolute most important thing any self-defense tool must have to be an A tier is that it has to be an equalizer. That you put this thing in someone's hand and now they become the bigger threat between the two people. Whereas if you have a 250 pound man attacking a 120 pound woman and she has a stick, she probably doesn't have a really strong chance of defending herself successfully. You could put this in a 90 pound woman's hand and it doesn't matter how big the guy is, she instantly becomes the more dangerous person in that room. And the reason for that being is that it doesn't require any real strength to use, it just requires training. Really, a pistol is kind of the fantasy kung fu promise come true. By that I mean, if you've studied martial arts for years, like I have, we've all been promised the same thing. That with martial arts, we would be able to stop a bigger, stronger, and more powerful opponent with little to no effort. Whereas that is sort of true, it's also not true because if you look at any combat sport such as wrestling, boxing, kickboxing, mixed martial arts, they all have weight classes and they have weight classes for a reason and that's because size and strength matter a lot in a fight. They play a huge role in a fight. Athleticism plays a huge role in a fight. But you could be the most athletic person on earth and you could be going against the weakest person that you could find and as long as they can point this gun and pull the trigger, you're gonna lose. I have to give it the small caveat in A tier that 
if you are not actively training with it, and by training, I mean self-defense training, I probably wouldn't put it in A tier. If you just bought a gun and you keep it on your hip and you don't really practice with it, I'd probably put it down here in C tier because you probably aren't gonna be able to hit your mark and you're probably not gonna have the reflexes to draw, aim, fire, and actually use it as a self-defense tool. But with appropriate training, no doubt in my mind, a gun is gonna be A tier. So it looks like the next weapon that Tier Maker has for self-defense weapon is a bow and arrow. I'm choosing these three as kind of my first three that I talk about because I think it will set a really good precedent on where the rest of the weapons lie. While a bow and arrow is definitely a profoundly deadly weapon, um, it does require a tremendous amount of training to be good at, which I think I'm going to say a lot in this video. What I can say about the bow and arrow is that it is definitively just not a self-defense weapon. So I got to immediately put it in F. So it is absolutely lethal. 100% a bow and arrow is lethal. But when we look at a self-defense weapon, we have to consider a lot of things other than can it kill my opponent or can it stop my opponent? We have to think about at what ranges it is most effective, how concealable and or carryable it is, and how long does it take to ready the weapon. See, the benefit of a stick and the benefit of a gun is effectively when it's in your hand, it is readied, right? So I, I pull my gun and it is ready. We're talking like hopefully less than a second, but at most a one second, two second draw for a gun. A stick is probably even faster because if you're carrying a stick, it's just already in your hand. Whereas a bow and arrow, uh, you know, you have to shoot it and then reload it and shoot it again and reload it. It's obviously not something that you can carry. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they're, they're, I'm going to see somebody like at a PTA meeting with their like, like bow strapped across their chest like, hey, you won't let me bring a gun in here and I got to stay safe. It's, it's hard for me to even explain why this is a stupid self-defense weapon because it is so stupid. Uh, but that kind of the long and short of it is that uh, you can't carry it and it's only really effective at a long range scenario. I really think if you're shooting a bow and arrow, it is actually impossible for you to be in a self-defense scenario. Most self-defense, one of the biggest complaints I oftentimes have about like guns is that most self-defense happens at a remarkably close range. And if your gun's like in your holster or even worse, if you keep your gun like a backpack or something, you know, you probably are a purse. You probably aren't going to be able to access that weapon very quickly, but a pistol would still work from a close range. Whereas a, a bow and arrow is going to be F tier because it's really only good at one range and that's not the self-defense range. Okay. So now we have a really good baseline, I think to understand like where things lie. So I can say it's like as good as a gun, worse than a gun, but better than a stick worse than a stick, but better than a bow and arrow or equal to a bow and arrow. That kind of gives us good, a good, I guess, measuring stick to measure everything else against. All right. So next is going to be the knife. And once again, because I study Kali, I'm going to have a lot of opinions about the knife. If you want to know the two primary weapons that you study while you are practicing Kali, it's usually these two guys right here that probably 90% of my time studying Kali has been spent either swinging a stick around or swinging a training knife around. So let me first talk about just the inherent downsides of a knife. So a knife is always going to be a close quarters weapon. So unlike a gun, you are not going to be able to stop the threat before they get close enough to hurt you. I also think that a knife requires a lot more training than people give it credit for. I will oftentimes hear people saying just like how inherently deadly somebody with a knife is. And while that is true, I've also read and studied a lot of situations in which an untrained person gets grappled while they hold a knife and the knife gets ripped from their hand and used against them. So just like probably any weapon that's going to be C tier and up, you're going to require some kind of training in order to use the knife. Having said that, I think the knife does have the benefit of that you instantaneously equalize the situation. That if you have, once again, like a 130 pound woman versus a 200 pound man, and you put that knife in her hand at 
minimum they're equal and probably in reality she is a more lethal presence within that confrontation than he is i also like the knife because it passes one of the very important tests when it comes to self-defense weaponry which is it should be harmful even if the person defends themselves so if you imagine if i swung a knife at you and you covered yourself you're still getting cut it's still going to cause a lot of damage for you just to protect yourself from this weapon and its very downside is also one of its great upsides is the fact that it does work at close quarters because most self-defense happens a lot closer than most people are really uh, aware of a knife allows you to have a tremendous advantage at a very close range but I do have to make it very clear it's not something that you're just going to put in your hand and you know like immediately be skilled with or immediately be able to wield well just like most of the actual weapons that I'm going to mention on this list it's going to require um, a certain level of training for you to be able to use it well however having said that and teaching Kali for several years it's not that much training generally somebody who has you know three to six months of Kali training is effectively unstoppable with a knife in their hand it you can learn how to use this as a deadly weapon extremely quick so um, I'm gonna put it at B tier uh, just because it it's limited in its range you can only do really use it from close quarters and of course it does require a lot of training to use but once again, that's going to be like all of them. I just think it's kind of B tier. I don't think a knife is as good as a gun. I definitely think a knife is better than a stick. So that's my logic between putting it at B. All right. So this next one that the interwebs has included baffles me. I don't even know why it's on the li this list. Maybe it's just kind of a troll or a joke, or maybe it's an inside joke that I don't know. But uh, it's a fire extinguisher. And I can see this being used as kind of a slapstick thing. Like, you know, someone attacks you and you spray it in their face and they start playing goofy music as you run away in fast motion. But um, I, I don't really understand how one would reliably train with a fire extinguisher. And it also seems like a fairly specific scenario in which you would be using this as your self-defense tool. Like... I can only picture this really working like right outside the bathrooms at a Chili's or, um, you know, in a food court at a mall, maybe, is where I'd have access to it. Uh, whereas I do have a fire extinguisher in my house, which everybody should. It's it's not like it's in this like prime spot for self-defense. So like my knee-jerk reaction is just kind of put it down in F. I don't even really consider a weapon. But you can could spray someone in the face with it, and that could give you an opportunity to get away. And I think you could use it as some sort of like bludgeoning tool. But it's not really designed to be held well. Um, see, like I kind of want to put it in D. And the second I put it in D, uh, I realized that... A fire extinguisher also has the pin that you'd have to pull out. So if you want to use the spray part of it, there's a whole nother step. It's not like you just pick it up and use it. So I don't know why it's on this list. It's kind of silly that it's on this list. I'm going to put it down here in F. I think I do I put it above in front of a bow and arrow or behind? I'll put it behind a bow and arrow because at least a bow and arrow is an actual weapon. Um, as far as even an improvised weapon, this one's kind of stupid. Okay, next up. Uh, is a hammer so a hammer has a lot of the same uh, strengths I guess of a knife because it when you have a hammer in your hand I definitely think you pretty much instantly become more deadly and it also has a benefit of it will hurt somebody if they try to defend against it so if I swung a hammer at you and you covered your head it would still do a tremendous amount of damage to you I also think that claw on the back of the hammer, this this guy right here, whoop, this little claw piece right here, I think that adds a, a big giant kind of X factor to a hammer that would be very interesting to use. I think you would need to have a bit of Kali or some sort of weapons-based training to really wield this reliably because it is an impact weapon. It is going to require a certain amount of strength in order to wield at a like deadly level but I think it's better than a stick but not as good as a knife 
just kind of like from the get go. Uh, because the thing is, like, both of these are hindered by kind of the same thing that um, both of them only really work from a close range. So you aren't going to use a hammer as a long range weapon like you would, say, a gun. The person has to get within punching range of you in order for you even to use the hammer, which means you're putting yourself more at risk by getting close enough to use it. And because you're in that close quarters, it's possible or much more likely for that weapon to get pulled from your hand and used against you but so that so so because it has a lot of the strength a lot of the weaknesses it feels like it should be right next to the knife but just kind of on this side of it but it's not sharp so it's not kind of inherently deadly if you want to make this weapon deadly you're gonna have to swing it really really hard uh if you've ever like cracked open a coconut with a hammer like that's the kind of force you're going to need which means some people are going to be able to wield a hammer in a really deadly way whereas other people are not going to be able to be deadly with a hammer they're just going to cause harm so i think it's better than a stick because it definitely hits harder than a stick but a stick is also a more versatile weapon because it has the close quarters and more of the long range um okay i'm gonna set it up like this uh but to be kind of blunt if it was like some other day i might have switched them so i, mean, I think that a hammer and a stick are kind of similar in how good they are for as a self-defense tool all right let's look at the next guy which is a baseball bat Okay, so kind of putting it bluntly, I think a baseball bat is kind of a stupid self-defense tool. Most baseball bats are going to be wielded most effectively with two hands. And any two-handed self-defense weapon is kind of a, a shitty weapon in my mind. It's okay if it's two-handed at a range, like at a distance. So, you know, like once again, our friend, whoop, the gun up here. But once someone gets close to you, I think it's really valuable to have a free hand. The free hand allows you to defend things more reliably. It also allows you to grapple and control people. I think if you had a baseball bat in the hand of somebody who did like a sword fighting art, like if you did historical European martial arts or something like kendo, I think a baseball bat might actually be a pretty badass tool in those people's hands but as far as a self-defense tool in general i think it's fairly limited in its application it definitely would hit hard it's definitely potentially lethal to an extent it's an equalizer but like i said with everything it will require some sort of strength in order to use the where i have issues with the baseball bat is that it's kind of limited in its range when we think about a stick, a stick is a one-handed weapon. So you have the free hand ready to defend or to grab and control. And you also have the reach of a stick. But because the stick has the puño and it is one-handed, I can very easily use it as a close quarters weapon as well to hit with the puño. Whereas a baseball bat, I feel like it's probably fairly limited in its ability to do any kind of close quarters fighting. Um, there's an old strategy in sword fighting. They say that, that, you know, if your opponent has a large sword, you have two choices, either have a longer sword than them or have a knife. And the idea is that if I can get within the cutting, if I can get past the cutting range of that person's weapon, they are sitting here trying to cut me with their big giant sword. And I'm able to get really close and hit with a knife. So longer weapons that aren't like projectile weapons longer weapons are good at a distance but the second someone gets close to you they kind of go to hell so another way to think about it is like how well would this work in a phone booth or or something like that and actually now that i mentioned it i don't even know why you would have like i'm gonna put this down in detail i don't even know why you would have a baseball bat so in it with the with the exception of the fact that you are actively playing baseball I think that the only reason why you would have a baseball bat is because you went and got it. So you're in some scenario where you like walked out to the garage to grab your baseball bat or you went to your car to grab a baseball bat. And if you have time to go get a weapon, you aren't defending yourself. You're about to assault somebody and probably break a whole lot of laws. So no, I think it's, I don't think it's a 
a good self-defense weapon. I'm going to put it in D tier. I'm not even sure if I should put it in D tier. I kind of want to put it in F just for like moral reasons. But I do think it's a better self-defense tool than uh, bow and arrow. So I will put it above it. Uh, but understand that like the scenarios in which you would be using this weapon, uh, you're probably not carrying this around. So once again, you know, picturing like someone at a PTA meeting, I seriously doubt that they're sitting there with their baseball bat, you know, like beside them saying like, yeah, yeah, I feel safe here with my baseball bat. You probably aren't carrying it as a self-defense tool. If you're using it, you probably went and got it. And if you have to go and fetch a weapon, then you are no longer defending yourself. You're probably assaulting somebody. Okay, let's look at the next guy. The whip or the tactical whip. Um, this is not a weapon that I have a lot of familiarity with. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it in the world of self-defense, but I've never really played with one or been struck by one. But I'll tell you what I have been struck by. It's those little things that you use to open your blinds. What are they called? What are they called? Blind tilt wand. So a wand. They're just called, they're called blind wands. But yeah, these things. These things. I've been hit by those things. Yeah, uh, when I was like a preteen maybe I remember getting into a scrap with a kid he was a friend and uh, he got really mad and grabbed one of those and like hit me with it and it was the worst experience of my life I mean I, I must have been like 12 years old and I'm in my 30s now and I still remember what it feels like to be hit by that thing so I can tell you right now this thing is one hell of a deterrent um, it is just pain compliance, so unlike a gun or a knife that could end someone's life, which isn't necessarily the goal of self-defense, um, I do think that this is a horrible enough experience that it would deter the vast majority of people if they got hit by it. Now, this is just kind of me musing about it because, once again, I've not really used one. But because it's flexible, I imagine that you could probably keep it on your person fairly easily. Like, maybe put it around your belt um, or, you know, shove it in a large coat pocket to have as a quick draw weapon. The other thing about flexible weapons, which is kind of interesting, a lot of people don't take into account, is that it's really hard to take a flexible weapon away from somebody uh, because it has that kind of cord to it and once again this is something i know from the whole being hit with a blind wand is that because it is flexible it was very difficult to wrestle out of their hands boy should i even tell that story that's a horrible story but kids suck kids suck just so you know like kids suck okay <laughs> Uh, so I'm not going to say that it's like this God mode tier up here with a gun, but it's definitely better than having a hammer because it has that long range uh, ability. Um, I also think this is one of the few weapons on this list. You know, a gun also being another one of these and maybe a knife, but a, a gun and this whip that actually has any kind of chance of dealing with multiple opponents that being able to, because the issue with something like say the baseball bat, is that when I swing a baseball bat, I have to do a recovery to use it again. So unless I'm super ambidextrous with my swings, I have to deal with the weight of that weapon. So once I swing it, I have to effectively like adjust my body to swing it again. So it's going to be a relatively slow weapon. Whereas with a whip, you can kind of just go like, bop, 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 bop. There's no real recovery time on that weapon. So I think it actually could serve well against multiple people. Another detail about these tactical whips that I've seen, uh, once again, not really played with, is that lots of times this handle can be used in a very similar way to how I was talking about the puño, the back end of a collie stick. And so you can hit the whack, whack, whack from a distance just like you would a collie stick, but if they get close, you can use that back end to defend yourself. So yeah, I think it feels good right here uh, in B tier. Uh, I kind of feel the same way how I had a hard time determining between these two. I'm going to give the knife a little bit more of an edge. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, just because it does have a lethal ability to it, which I'm not a big fan of like the idea of like so your solution for self-defense is killing somebody. But when we talk about raw stopping power, a lethal item 
is going to have more stopping power than a non-lethal item for the most part. Okay, so let's look at our next guy on the tier list, and, and it's a rock. So a rock is a self-defense tool I don't think I've ever really considered most of these other ones, except for things over here in F tier, I've thought about. But a rock is a really interesting thing because if you have a rock in your hand, any kind of palm striking, I imagine, would be a more effective tool. Uh, oh, also, if you come from an art that throws things like palm heel hooks, a rock would be really good. So you could actually use like some Kenpo techniques, throw a rock in it, and suddenly it's even more deadly. It's more effective as Kenpo. So that's kind of cool. Um, but a rock does suffer from a lot of issues once I start actually thinking about it. So it is a bludgeoning weapon, which means it is inherently not the most effective thing because bludgeoning weapons require a certain level of strength to use, which I keep on saying. Uh, it's also a very close quarters weapon. It's actually... I think of all of these, it's the closest quarters weapon. It's the one that would really require you to get cl most like tied up with somebody in order to use. And I think the rock is included here because the idea that like rocks are everywhere. But to my experience, that's not actually true. Um, I live in Indiana and most of our, and there are a lot of rocks in Indiana but the vast majority of them are like stuck deeply in the dirt and the mud. It's not like I can just reach down and pick up a rock. So maybe if you live in a less wet area where there's a lot of exposed rocks, maybe it'd be good. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I, I, I come across so few rocks. I've never even considered it as a self-defense tool. And I'm like I've considered a baseball bat and a hammer before. I've never thought about a rock. Uh Boy, but it might work in a pinch. I'm going to put it over here in D. Anytime I make these videos, I always think about D as in like a good enough. Like like you probably don't want to use anything in D, but like if you got nothing else, D is fine. Because uh, I feel like if you, if you use a bow and arrow for self-defense or if you used a fire extinguisher from self, for self-defense, you might actually be worse off using those or attempting to use those than if you were empty-handed. Whereas, like, I, I don't think you're going to die if you get a rock. I think it gives you, like, the slightest bit of advantage. But I think the ability to use a rock as a self-defense tool almost entirely depends on your skills as a martial artist. That if you don't really understand striking and footwork and distance management and how to already get powers behind your strikes, I don't really think a rock's gonna, you know, help you that much. But I can see a rock as like an exclamation point to your martial arts. So that's where we're gonna put it. I'm gonna put it down in D tier. Next up is the Kubaton. This is a weapon that I was really, really big about um, until I started using them. <laughs> so, Kubatons get used a lot in Filipino martial arts, which, like I said multiple times, that much of most of my weapon training, to be honest, is from Filipino martial arts. And whereas the puño, the back end of a stick, is a fairly effective striking tool, it's because it has all that extra weight behind it. Kind of think about the way a pull cue works, right? That if a pull cue was smaller, like if it was shorter, you'd get less force out of a pull cue. Even though you're hitting with the tip of a pull cue, it's the back end weight is what's actually giving it its striking power. And so a Kubaton has the issue of the fact that there's no weight behind the strike. So your ability to use a Kubaton effectively almost entirely depends on how strong you are and your ability to actually like create that blunt trauma with it, even if it has this little spike on it. I said that I was really big on Kubaton and still I started actually practicing with one. And something I found, at least with most Kubatons, is that they aren't really designed that well to stay in your hand. If you look at anything that you actually have to hold, so like a hammer or a knife or a gun, you'll notice that the shape of the handle is relatively large and generally kind of has an almost an oval shape 
to it. That our grip isn't like a circle like this. Our grip tends to make this little oval shape like that. And if you look at it, our grip's actually quite large. So our, our ability to grip really, really tiny things like a stick is actually not that good. We kind of do best grabbing onto something that's kind of about the size of a, of a knife handle, which makes sense because, you know, knives are designed to be held. Whereas Kubatons tend to be very small, that they're almost like pins. And the idea behind them is that you can put them on your keychain or keep them in your pocket and then just boom, you suddenly have this weapon. But I don't think it would give you that tremendous of an advantage. Most of the Kubaton techniques that I've learned through Filipino martial arts are not really techniques that I would consider fight ending techniques. There's a lot of like gunting where you're like passing a punch and then striking at the bicep and then like coming in with a back fist. Um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff with Kubaton, which I could see these as like deterrents, but I think all Kubaton really is, is kind of, kind of like how I was saying about the rock that I think a Kubaton is mostly just an exclamation point to add on top of an already well-developed martial skill. I don't think people are just inherently more dangerous just because they have a Kubaton in their hand. There is a really predatory market in the self-defense world of people effectively just saying like, oh, if you just have this, you'll be safe. And there is no such thing as something like that. I mean, if you think once again about how just extremely powerful a pistol actually is for self-defense, and I'm telling you right now that a pistol requires training to use, um, this thing's going to require a tremendous amount of training. So if you have a Kubaton and you plan to use it, you need to get into Kali classes. And we offer Kali classes twice a week at the School of Self-Defense here in Indianapolis. What's up? Promos, plugging stuff, trying to be a business fan. Okay, so next one. Oh boy. Oh boy. This guy. Pepper spray, mace depending on, on where, where you live, is to changes what you carry. Um, I love this stuff. Specifically, if I'm gonna recommend a style of pepper spray, I would recommend the kind that shoot in a straight line so that you can kind of intentionally target the person you're spraying at. There are some that kind of shoot a giant mist and those tend to be less effective and have a higher risk of you actually pepper spraying yourself and pepper spraying everyone else around you. Whereas with the straight line, it's kind of like shooting a water gun. Like you can see where it's aiming while it's spraying and ensure it gets into their eyes. Uh, I think a lot of the issues with pepper spray has a lot more to do with the marketing than the weapon itself. Where effectively the marketing is you buy this and now you're safe and that's not necessarily the case. Um, if you don't have that pepper spray actively in your hand at the moment that you are attacked, it is probably not going to be a viable self-defense tool. So if you have pepper spray in your purse and someone's actively attacking you, it's not like you're going to have time to rummage through your purse and pull it out. You'd have to have it already in your hand. There's also generally a safety switch on most pepper sprays. So you would want to get a pepper spray and like a trainer that shot water or something that would allow you to practice the use of this weapon. But having said that, um, this has some of the greatest stopping power I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, even You don't even have to be pepper sprayed. Just go on YouTube and look at videos of people being pepper sprayed. And it's incredible how it just stops people in the tracks. It's a long range weapon that could also be used in a close range. It's relatively small, easily concealable, easily carried, and oftentimes more legal than a gun. One thing to remember about any kind of self-defense scenario is that if you kill someone, you will be treated as a criminal. Whether or not you get let off for self-defense is a question about how good of a defense you actually have. Um, as far as the pepper spray is concerned, uh, the worst case scenario of hitting somebody with pepper spray is that you would be charged with some kind of assault, but you would not be charged with murder or attempted murder. Uh, you wouldn't have to worry about that. Yeah, pepper spray is just crazy effective. I think it's generally a, I think it could even be equivalent to a pistol 
because it has all the stopping power, it has a long range, it's concealable, it's easily carryable, and it's even something that you could carry in a lot of the places you can't carry a gun, which actually might make it a slightly better self-defense tool than a pistol. Because I don't think you're allowed to carry pepper spray in like a government building. You might be, I don't know. But I, I'm sure that you can carry it in like schools and most states don't have a ban on it. I don't know if other countries do. Um, I don't know if that's as, as sensitive as a topic as pistols are in those countries. But I do know that generally speaking, you can carry pepper spray in more places legally than you can a pistol. So yeah, I think pepper spray is really, really good. It has a tremendous amount of stopping power. It's an equalizer. If someone is smaller using it, they're instantly the more dangerous person in the room. Yeah, pepper spray is awesome. 10 out of 10, that's an A tier weapon. So next thing is a collapsible baton. I don't much like these things. Um, let me start off by kind of hedging off the negative comments about this. I'm aware that if you hit someone with this, it will hurt them. My issue with collapsible batons has a lot more to do with the deployment and practicality of carrying it. If you look at everything in B tier and A tier, all of these are things that you could probably carry on you anywhere in almost any situation and, uh, there, and, and you'd be fine. It's easily concealable. Most every collapsible baton that I've ever seen is at least this big when it is collapsed. So unless you have a job in which you have some sort of goodie belt that would allow you to carry a collapsible baton, I don't think it would be good self-defense. I think if you're in a situation where you are like whipping this thing out, you have probably seen that violence from afar and are just choosing to go towards it, which isn't really a self-defense scenario. I understand there's a lot of people who maybe have jobs in which they are required to go towards violence, like if you are a police officer or if you are a bouncer, but as far as just general civilian self-defense, I, I think that this is almost once again kind of a power fantasy that like oh you carry it with you because like you 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 intend you want to use it in some fashion um a stick is something that i think you could reasonably carry with you in most places um no i don't i don't think that at all that's a lie um whereas you know i could probably say a lot of the same stuff with a stick sticks are just everywhere so you know a broom handle is a stick um once again, like I said, the stick kind of serves as a replacement for a lot of different weapons. Um, I do think it's a fairly effective weapon, but I just don't necessarily think it's great self-defense, if that makes sense. Okay, so this next one, uh, I'm going to, I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to get on a soapbox on this next one, which is kind of funny because my entire channel is like a giant self-defense soap box um dogs dogs for self-defense i am not the biggest fan of dogs for self-defense and let me clarify where they are self-defense so that i can clarify why i don't like them um a hundred percent if you train a dog to attack human beings uh, they're going to probably win those fights if they attack another human being and statistically, a dog is a tremendous deterrent for most assaults. That, so like if a woman is like jogging down the street with a dog versus without a dog, she greatly decreases her chances of being assaulted by just the fact that she has a dog with her. Same thing goes with like robberies. Um, that someone's trying to rob a house, they are less likely to rob a house if they hear a dog barking because they don't want to deal with that shit. Um, so a dog can be a tremendous deterrent. And I don't have any issue with someone taking their dog out for a run and even feeling a little safer because their dog is with them. That makes a lot of sense to me. My issue with dogs as self-defense is that dogs do not get to have a choice in be being turned into a weapon. See, all these other things on this list are inanimate objects. So, so it doesn't matter if we use them as a tool. Uh, Whereas a lot of dogs like to have jobs, I don't think 
many dogs enjoy the act of fighting, that it's probably scary and awful uh, for them as well. And even if you don't care about the well-being of a dog, I think you have there's a serious moral issue with training a dog to be violent towards people. You want a dog that serves as an alarm in your house, that's fine. My dog barks like crazy if, you know, a, a stranger were to come into the house or if someone knocks on the door or, you know, if, I don't know, there's a, a strong wind outside. <laughs> but, uh, but I would never want my dog to be in the habit of attacking people because if you, if you think, like, the likelihood of a peaceful stranger coming to your door versus a violent stranger coming to your door, it's far more likely that if the person is, is on your property that they don't actually mean any harm statistically. So the, the dog is just not appropriate for that. The long and short of this is a dog isn't a tool. A dog is a pet and it should be treated as a pet. Um, there will be no, there will be absolutely no uh, weapons on this list that I'm going to put as less of a self-defense tool than a dog because it, you should never train dogs to hurt human beings. That's not okay. Getting off of that soapbox, let's talk about the sledgehammer. Um, so we have, <laughs> these are terrible pictures. I don't know who put this together, but a sledgehammer is a less effective baseball bat, um, but it's more effective than a cubaton or a rock. It has basically all the issues of a baseball bat, but even a longer recovery time. Because it is a heavy impact weapon, it is not something that is going to be reasonably wielded by somebody who is small and weak, and that doesn't make it a great self-defense weapon. If you've ever done like demolition work and handed a sledgehammer to a much smaller person, it's pretty shocking how little power output they're able to get out of it, even though it's specifically designed to demolish things. Yeah, I think you need skill and um, strength in order to wield it effectively. And that swing, the swing on a sledgehammer is extremely pulling and it's intended to crash through things and like hit its mark hard. But so if you actually successfully hit someone with this thing, it would work. But the pullback, trying to get it back into another position for a second attack is really unreasonable. If we look at anything from the C tier and up, we see a bunch of tools that can attack in one direction and then immediately attack in another direction. Um, and that's very important in self-defense because self-defense isn't super stationary. Self-defense is generally, there's a lot of movement going on in self-protection. And so you need to be able to hit from several different angles. I don't think that this has that kind of versatility, at least not for the average person. Maybe if you were you know, half Thor maybe can do it. Maybe he can swing it like that. I can't though, um, which I think makes it, uh, and I'm not exactly a small dude, so I don't think it makes it a great self-defense tool. I also think you run into the same kind of moralistic thing with a sledgehammer. Like, why do you have a sledgehammer? Are, in a self-defense situation, are you actively going out and like, walking around with a sledgehammer in your hand uh, did you magically have a sledgehammer in your hand at the moment you were attacked or is this something that you're actively going and seeking to grab to hit somebody with remember if you have to like leave the scene of violence and then come back to hit somebody with something it's probably not self-defense it's almost assuredly assault except for in the very rare occasion that you would be protecting somebody all right so the next one we have is going to be keys and keys are probably responsible for the largest array of bullshit self-defense advice um, in the entire market. So when you put a key in your hand, what they normally recommend is like putting a key in your hand like Wolverine. Like, so let me go get let me go get my keys. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Okay, and I'm back. So this move. This is the move that they always tell you to do, that you're going to put your key in your hand and you're going to throw punches like a Wolverine. So one thing that I think is really worth noting about this strategy is that um, you actually would have to already have a lot of skill about how to box in order to reliably hit this in the first place. So if you are completely untrained 
in striking. If you haven't been studying boxing for like six months to a year or more, this would already be a stupid strategy. But even then, it's a dumb strategy because I want you to watch what happens when I punch my hand with a key. I want you to see, I'm trying to hurt myself now. Pop! See what just happened? My hand is fine and the key recedes into my grip. All right? The, th the fact is your ability to pinch here is so weak that it can't actually hold a key in place. So usually what happens is what you just saw there is that the key gets pushed into your grip like this, or more often than not, if you don't punch straight, you end up having the key kind of doing one of these things, which isn't that great either. Um, I've also seen some people recommend that you use it like a little dagger and stab, or you use it like a coubaton like this and stab. And once again, showing you that it's not necessarily going to just stay in your grip. You're going to need a strong grip. I'm just hitting my hand, trying to go through my hand. That was not pleasant, but it didn't, it didn't go through my hand. If you look at just put a little, little dent. Um, this is not going to be a great tool for self-defense. One of the mission statements of my channel is to kind of slay the dragons in the world of self-defense and one of the biggest dragons that needs to die is going to be keys as self-defense they're not self-defense please don't use them as such all right next thing nunchucks nunchucks um nunchucks are a really fascinating weapon so if you know how to use nunchucks then you probably know that they're kind of a stupid actual self-defense tool. So something I've kind of alluded to several times is how quickly somebody becomes dangerous once they have that weapon. Like it is putting that weapon in their hand make them the more dangerous person in the confrontation. And whereas nunchucks do cause damage, they do hurt, I think in general nunchucks are equally dangerous to the practitioner as they are to the person you might be using them on. It requires skill and a tremendous, and I mean a tremendous amount of training to wield nunchucks with any kind of safety or power. There's also kind of this idea that the chain of a nunchuck creates like this like whipping effect so that maybe you'll get like a similar effect as these, but with like a, a heavy whip at the end of it. And at least as far as my knowledge and my experience is concerned, they actually tend to hit softer than sticks. I know that's crazy. There are a lot of people who really love nunchucks, but they are not really that great because they require a tremendous amount of skill to use, way more skill to use than a stick, and they hit about as hard, if not less hard than a stick. And then you also get into kind of the odd legal thing that these are things that are commonly used for self-defense. These here, knife, a uh, hammer, a stick are clearly improvised weapons. This is clearly a self-defense weapon. Nunchucks a lot of times are viewed as more troublemaker weapons than self-defense weapons. Uh, they are, you, you, you have a chance of getting into legal trouble with using nunchucks and there are some places where you're just downright not allowed to carry them i think it's a weapon that requires a tremendous amount of discipline to use you know and which i always thought was really funny that the the weapon that requires the most discipline to get good at is the one that they gave to the least disciplined ninja turtle dog i just realized something master splinter was trying to teach him something he gave them the nunchuck so that he would learn discipline. Dang. So nunchucks, eh, they're better, but better than a baseball bat. Worse than a baseball bat. I'm gonna put them. I'm gonna put them here. Boy, I put a lot of things in D. <laughs> um, but I put them in D for a reason, because they aren't really D's kind of my like. It could be a self defense weapon, um, but probably isn't a great self defense weapon. I think. Maybe I should put them down, down here in F. Is it better than a rock? I don't know. I don't know if it's better than a rock. I'm going to put it in F. I think it's, I think nunchucks are worse than a rock. I think. 
boy, as this list gets filled up, this gets increasingly harder for me to think about. Because we're kind of like running out of the actual self-defense weapons I gave a shit about. A lot of these ones that are down here are so silly to use for self-defense that I've not really given deep thought onto them. Because it's just like, oh, yeah, a fire extinguisher is not something I think about as far as self-defense. It just wouldn't cross my mind because it's kind of dumb. But let's look at these guys. So as far as the effectiveness of brass knuckles. So brass knuckles are interesting. I've, I've got to play with them before. And not that I've like ever hit anybody with them. But I've hit things with them. And something I found really interesting is that if you train correctly. If, you're, if you actually are somebody who knows how to punch bare knuckle. You tend to hit with your first two knuckles. Like this. So the impact is like this on your hand. Some Wing Chun guys will hit with their bottom three knuckles here like this, but still it's, it's kind of this like very top of your fist. So you aren't actually hitting with the whole fist. So you don't hit like this, you hit like this. And when I held brass knuckles, what I thought was kind of frustrating about them is that they, if they, they tended to end up with the, the like dangerous part of it right here right in the part where i didn't punch so when i actually hit something the brass knuckle didn't actually hit so i'd have to actively and intentionally hit incorrectly with this which i think the idea of a brass knuckle is that like you just put it on and now your punches hit harder and if i punched correctly at least the way the ones that i had the ones i was using they they wouldn't allow me to hit correctly and use them at the same time these aren't like a tool that you hit hard with i think that's a misconception they're actually something you would do quick jabs with um and so as far as a weapon in that case they do work so like they tremendously increase how much damage your punch does it actually is kind of creates a lot of cuts but you want to talk about the legality thing you want to talk about how like dubious having a gun is boy brass knuckles are a one-way ticket to um, uh, legal issues. I would not consider these a self-defense tool whatsoever. Um, if you have time to put your brass knuckles on, it means you saw the violence coming from a mile away, and you're probably in some sort of street fight and not in a self-defense scenario. Um, I think you are probably um, not ever going to see someone use these in real life as a self-defense tool. Like, oh my God, I got mugged at an ATM and I threw on my brass knuckles and I hit the guy. It's like, no, these are all things I could just pull out. You know, that like I draw my gun and it's ready. I draw my pepper spray and it's ready. I draw my knife and it's ready. Uh, brass knuckles are something that you'd have to use some fine motor skills to put on your hand and then use them. You aren't going to have like a quick draw with your brass knuckles. Um, so yes, brass knuckles are a weapon and they will hurt really badly, just like nunchucks would are a weapon and would hurt really badly. But I think both of these are tools that if you are using them, you're probably just assaulting somebody. And the next one is going to be some kind of taser or stun gun. I can't see the front of it. All right, so it looks like it's probably a taser. So that, that, that kind of looks similar to the thing that they have here. So I'm going to pull this up so that I can talk about this a little closer. So the way that tasers fire, it shoots out these two barbs that plug into the person's body and kind of create a circuit and then it pulsates electricity through it and it incapacitates the person. And I find that these things work um, only like 50% of the time. And it's because it's very common that one of them hits the person and one of them misses entirely. And then it doesn't really do its job. Uh, there is like some argument to be made that, you know, without its cartridge, it could be used, you know, kind of like this kind of taser here where you can like zap the person, but that requires you sitting there holding it on the person. Uh, it has stopping power as long as it is working. So if a taser is working, um, you know, I probably put it up here in like B tier if you, if you're successful and get that shot correctly. And it is just kind of just by its nature, a more difficult weapon to carry on you. Um, just because of kind of cultural reasons, uh, somebody walking around with like a gun in America is something you would see all the time. Whereas only really like a cop or a security officer of some sort would have a weapon 
like this. I think this could be a good weapon for anybody, once again, who has a job that requires them to run towards danger. But as far as self-defense is concerned, um, I don't know. It's probably like a C tier. Maybe it's a D. No, it's a C tier. Okay, because like if I'm thinking about D tier as kind of like this is where the weapons that like I guess you could use for self-defense are and then C tier and up are me saying like yes you, you know these are actual self-defense weapons I would put a taser in that range but I don't know if I think a taser is better than a stick and that says a lot I think about the issues of a taser as a self-defense tool um, I think it's important just to reiterate that if both of the barbs land in the person, it works tremendously well. But it's so common for only one barb to hit, either because a second one kind of misses or the person's wearing thick clothing and it doesn't get through the clothing and get a good tight bite on their body, um, that it's not really that reliable. Man, I'm tired of putting stuff in D tier, but I just said this isn't reliable and I can't I can't possibly put a self-defense weapon in C tier or up if it's not reliable. So it looks like most of the things on this list were not really great self-defense weapons. Okay, so this is what we got. Uh, I'm going to say that the C tier and up are going to be the tools that like, yeah, for sure, you can defend yourself with these. B tier and up are the things I actually think are worth spending your time training with. So taking Kali will teach you how to use these two things and then taking a basic pistol course, self-defense courses, and then there's even you know uh, ways that you can practice with pepper spray. These top, the A and B tier, they're going to be worth your time to actually um, practice and spend money on and get good at using these tools. Everything else here um, are either going to be Kind of just improvised weapons are downright going to get you in some kind of legal trouble if you were to use them. Especially when I make tier list videos like this, people will comment on them having not watched the entire thing. So do me a favor and include the word death stick into your comment so that you and I will both know that you made it to the end. And this video has been pretty long and you're still here, so you clearly are enjoying my content. So please be sure to hit the thumbs up button, click the subscribe button, and click the bell button so you can get notified whenever I make a new video. Also, for those of you who are living in the Indianapolis area and you'd like to come train with me, all the information you need is on our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. And if you live too far away to train with me in person, we actually are offering Zoom classes every Wednesday, and you can sign up for those classes right here on the schoolofselfdefense.com. So until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Fight on.